change. Once we get more projects on the ground, we become more fluid and, and can really implement things quickly and more cost effectively and have a variety of types of materials that will help reduce costs. So I think, as I mentioned at the top there, that um, I'm, I'm not a biker, and that number, I think, is more jarring to people who are not bike enthusiasts and people who don't mm-hmm. plan on using bicycles anytime in the near future. You hear $400 million and go, hold on, because, and I have to play devil's advocate here a little bit with this, because I think when you hear about a city's bike plan, it almost feels like one of those um, things that you see on Twitter or social media like that about major major American cities that are great for bikes and not great for bikes. And they list the kind of thing where, yeah. where it, it, right. it feels like that kind of thing that you're hearing about to take it from where if you're not a bike person, it really is something that you kind of maybe scroll past to $400 million plan that you're talking about potentially. It's a big leap for people who are not as invested in it. Talk about the engagement and investment level for people who are serious about this and just how much of a big deal it is for the number of people in Kansas City that want this to be implemented. Well, this 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 all started with the directive of the city manager and the city council to give us a plan that will help us become a platinum-level bike community. And what a platinum-level bike community requires is a robust network, a robust education and outreach program, and a lot of support, both you know, in terms of time expended on programs and policies, but mm-hmm. also money, you know, that this council directs towards us. So, you know, because we've heard so many people's opinions over the last two years, it has become evident to us that throughout the city, there are a wide variety of audiences that care deeply about this subject matter. It is certainly not the only subject in the city that that matters. Sure. But Transportation influences economic prosperity. It influences housing choice. It influences physical activity. It influences yeah. life expectancy. So while some people might see the bike plan as an effort of, oh, well, it's just, you know, snobby white guys in spandex shorts. <laughs> on, Twitter. Know, on Twitter. On Twitter. On Twitter. You know, the Twitterati is just yelling and we got to get the, the plan out. It, it is more than that. You know, we, we, we spoke with high school students each year in this project uh, at East High School. They have a bike club where they learn each semester how to put a bike together and then they get to keep it and, you know, use it like any other high school student in the country yeah. and to and from wherever they want to if they don't have a car. Um, it's important to students. We heard from, you know, folks who are who are older in age that while they may not be out riding bikes, bike infrastructure on streets slows traffic down. It decreases crossing distances. So it helps people walking on the street to be safer. So this uh, this plan tries to reinforce those messages and also, you know, makes it clear to the city council that if they're serious about becoming a, a, a bike platinum city, you know, let's let's put some resources towards it to help staff do that. Joe, you've mentioned um, a couple other methods of transportation. Mobility is a key component of discussion uh, in the city these days. How does this bike plan fit into other modes of transportation that you just mentioned, whether it's you know uh, street calming or or pedestrian safety, scooters, scooters? Uh, you know, the ATA is always working to you know kind of fine tune their service. You know, we have the possibility of the expanded streetcar down to UMKC. How does this plan fit into those other modes of transportation? I'd say very well. Um, a variety of modes of transportation equals freedom for everybody, right? Freedom of choice, freedom of ability. Um, throughout this process, we worked with our friends at the Streetcar Authority. We've been, Beth and I have both been on, a, on, on the team setting some of the policies for scooters. We, we talk with our partners at the Mid-America Regional Council, at MoDOT, at the KCATA on a regular project-by-project basis and a plan-by-plan basis. So none of our recommendations are new to our agency partners. None of our recommendations will be a surprise to to those making other types of transportation decisions. We really just uh, are looking forward to the opportunity to help the public understand how we've gotten to where we've gotten to and what the path forward is. I want to get back to something you said earlier about the platinum level distinction. What What is that from? Who, who, who decides whether or not a city is platinum level? Who rates that that you mentioned there? Yeah, the League of American Bicyclists is an organization that started in the late 1800s um, that basically now functions as an advocate, national advocate for, sure. for biking. And what they do is is something called a Bicycle Friendly Community Program, which rates your city based on infrastructure completed, programs implemented, educational enforcement activities, policies that you have, all that sort of help put a, a, a figure on is your, is your community supporting bicyclists. Some of the best cities in the country are, you know, Portland, Minneapolis, Madison, Wisconsin, 
Uh, there's actually only six bike platinum communities. Do we have a rating right now? We do. We've been a bronze level community since 2011, which is a good achievement. Um, and it's in large part in d- due to some of the infrastructure we've put into the ground, but also our, our friends at BikeWalk KC and Revolve KC and Cycling KC. They all have really robust education programs that have helped us get there. So the the League of American Bicyclist Friendly Program rating is is just a metric like any other metric. It's imperfect. Um, but we want to strive to grow in that metric. And so our bike plan recommends by the next five years, try to get to that next level, silver, right? So there's bronze, silver, gold, platinum. Um, we want to get to that next level, you know, before we start continuing to aim towards uh, platinum. I'd like to pivot from our young Cokie Roberts over to um, Beth here. Sorry, that's an inside joke about Joe's <laughs> hair looking like Cokie Roberts. It's fantastic hair. Or, hair. or Blanche from the Golden Girls. <laughs> no, you've got a great head of and hair, Joe. And he's very much in character right now as Cokie. <laughs> like, you're seriously, like, the headphones, the microphone, you've got it. I'm, he I'm he is Cokie. Like, yeah. watch out. He's really going to be her replacement. <laughs> so, Beth, um, I was lucky enough to once go on a little bike tour with Joe, actually, and I found, you know, I personally on a bike felt a little bit unsafe, felt like I was kind of right there on top of the traffic. You were in public works during the installation of the city's first protected bike lanes along Armour. Is that, um, first of all, tell me kind of why that's a thing that makes cyclists feel safer. And second of all, is this something that we'll see figure prominently in the bike plan? Yeah, I think, I mean, the implementation of the Armour bike lanes was our first real application of what's called a parking protected bike lane. Again, it's that barrier separation between the bicyclists and traffic. And in, as Joe mentioned, in, in some of our discussions with the, the greater public, what we've heard from a lot of people is that they would feel safer, and data kind of shows that people feel safer if there is some sort of something, some vertical element that separates uh, bicyclists from traffic, um, something more than just a line of paint. So we, we, we kept hearing that, and I think, you know, with armor being uh, a corridor that is dense, um, a corridor that relies a lot on on street parking. That's one of the things you have to think about when you're doing parking protected bike lanes is if there are going to be cars there. Um, so that was, you know, that was the choice for that for that stretch. Um, and I think what we've seen is is people utilizing it. We've seen, um, you know, our need to kind of think about snow removal and 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 move forward with some some techniques to to address those those things um, which we're doing. Um, but also, you know, we've we've just kind of, uh, you know, had a good community conversation as, as a result of that. One of the elements of anything new on the street is education. So it's really just having that conversation with the community. And, and, and at the front end of that, it was a lot of, okay, here's how you park. Here's where you park. And, and you see a lot of um, sort of um, herd mentality that develops there. One person does it right, and then they're like, oh, that's how you do it. And, you know, there's some of that, but there, there's also a need to – to get that message out there. So that's been kind of the challenge with that one. But I think it's, uh, you, you check it today and you'll see people figured it out. So people are smart. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> but, I, and I, you, you mentioned that. I, I think to go back to something that Joe said at the very top, that I'm the target audience here of someone that doesn't do this or someone who's afraid to do that. I think that's exactly how I would feel of, listen, I haven't been on a bike in a long time. I don't want to hop in the middle of the road and have nothing but paint to separate me from traffic. So I think that's a, a huge difference between I'd, getting new bikers out there. And I'd put myself in that category, too. And I just wanted to tell you that, you know, uh, I know you haven't been on a bike in a, ride, in a while, but when you get back on, it's like riding a bike. Well, <laughs> thank God, because I'm, I've been I'm, waiting to tell that joke, look that at horrible, that. horrible, cheesy line. No, it was not. Time. Listen, there have been accurate. much cheesier things said in here. It is, it is accurate. So what's the next phase for this? We talk about the plan, the plan, the plan. And who has to approve this? Who has to sign off on it? What's what's next for this? Uh, so the 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 four forthcoming open houses are the ne- are the very next step. We want to make sure that the public is aware of what we've done and is okay with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we'll move into the adoption process. We'll take it to our uh, bike pet advisory committee at the city uh, at the end of February. We'll take it to the parks board. You know, our parks board has jurisdiction over parkways and boulevards. And then we go into the regular sort of plan adoption process, which includes a hearing in front of the city plan commission, and then a most likely a joint transportation infrastructure and planning zoning economic development committee. That's a mouthful <laughs> there for a committee. Yeah, yeah. T and I, P Z E D. Yeah, that's much better. That's, that's um, much better. But uh, one of the things I've tried to learn over the process is not not using uh, industry jargon. So that's why I just said it out loud. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but we'd, we'll need we'll need those bodies to to make a recommendation to the full council, and then hopefully by late March, early April, oh, wow. the latest, we'll have a we'll have a decision. Okay. Do you have any indication right now of how people are leaning? How that's going to go? Do you feel like it's going to be a pretty smooth process, or is this a uphill battle, so to speak? I mean, if we can get something about the airport on that same docket, it'll probably be a, a smooth <laughs> <Yeah>. process. <Yeah. laughs> oh okay. And if it's an uphill battle, we do have e-bikes. So, Look at oh that. yeah, another bike. Bad. Yeah, we'll just you know scoot our way towards the. Finish oh, and line. scoot! Yeah. Look at that. Well, yeah. I think Beth said oh. yesterday that they're pedaling to the finish line in her. Uh, Man, her yeah. no, but we we yeah. we have we have some good champions on city council for this project. You know, Councilman Fowler in the Northlands has been a real strong supporter of this whole go around. Councilman Councilwoman Justice mm-hmm. in the Southland has been. Uh, you know, a, a good supporter, and and there's a lot of other people on city council who have participated in our events throughout the course of the last two years. Uh, so there will probably be some some concerns and some comments, just like any other sure. good document. But I think we've done a we've done our due diligence to make sure people know what's happening. Are you ready to be in that hot seat, Joe, and answer those questions? As ready as any good city employee can be. <laughs> he's nailing the podcast, yeah. so I think he's going to be fine. <laughs> That's true. It was. Um, I felt bad because last week for the airport committee, oh they, they combined that with transportation and infrastructure. Power was out at City Hall, but they had it planned for the airport. So Joe is, you know, in this room just filled with all of these airport <laughs> employees, um, all these people in the Edgemore team. We're all expectantly waiting for that, and Joe's like, "Okay, well, we're going to talk about the bike plan first. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's that's what I was saying. You know, that's the first time we dropped that. Uh, you know that nine figure price tag. And yeah, got a couple side eyes, but uh, you know, you put that right up next to the airport, and <laughs> what what's four hundred million? A little yeah. perspective. <laughs> One other thing, looking forward, can this serve as kind of a foundation for uh, a regional plan? Uh, you, you know, ultimately, hopefully, this is something that just doesn't, you know, end at State Line Road. And and you had mentioned that one of your partners was Mark. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other things that some of the other a- agencies across the metro are doing that can plug into this plan? Well, to be brutally honest, we're actually catching up to the rest of the metro in terms of bike mm-hmm. plans. Um, the city of Overland Park, about a year and a half before we started this process, implemented their f- bike master plan. Um, Prairie Village on the Kansas side also is just finishing up their master plan as well. Um, the mid America Regional Council in 2014 adopted a regional bikeways plan. When they did that plan, it incorporated the routes from our original Bike KC plan. But we, we coordinated a lot with those cities to make sure that we're hitting on you know, that we're not ending, you know, at a street that doesn't make sense in a neighboring community. Yeah. Well, obviously this is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm surprised by the speed that you're talking about. It could move. Joe is posing for a picture. That's, that's, that's the beauty of the podcast studio is all that can happen at one time. <laughs> yeah, uh, the PIO I have. That's Hey, go for it. I'm, I'm surprised at the speed which you're saying that this could, this could happen. So we'll have to watch for that. And I think it's really interesting the the topic that you both bring up there about how, um, this particularly can drive the economy in a different kind of way. When you think about the kind of people who would want to be using bikes and what they'd want to be using bikes for, whether it be spending money on different places they'd go to on a bike, that kind of thing. It's interesting to think about what could happen in the future if this is uh, approved. So we'll be watching that eagerly. And um, right. yeah, it's, we'll, it's, it's, we'll be watching for you on a bike. Oh, that, that, I'd send a photographer out Ooh, if you did that. Man. You'll see the world a different or, way on a bike. I have or, one. I or, have one. I just haven't instead, been on it in a long time. <laughs> instead of proposal, if you will, okay. Oh, hey. The day that this goes before full council for uh, adoption, oh man, it would be fantastic to do a bike ride from City Hall. Either maybe it's a bike ride out of pain because it hasn't passed, or <laughs> hopefully it's a bike ride out of joy because it's passed. A celebratory. <laughs> Or dirge of a bike ride. A celebratory or reconciliation. Yeah, ride. there we go. <laughs> Either way. Okay, yeah. well, we'll have to look for that. And and it it might, maybe it ends at, you know, Boulevard. Ooh, who yeah, knows? I'm yeah, married yeah. to the kind of person who will absolutely go, oh, yeah, we should do that. That's what she would <laughs> say. We should get bikes and go. And I'll be like, you don't have a bike. She's like, don't worry about it. That's what she would say. <laughs> Easy solution so say across, the, track, right? yeah, across the street from City Hall is a Kansas City B-cycle state. <laughs> there you go. So you don't even need to own a bike. Don't even need to own a bike, and you can be ready to go. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Beth, thank you both for being here today and, and talking about this. It's really Thanks for having thank us. You. Yeah, thank it. you. Welcome back to another edition of 41 Files. We've been talking transportation today on today's episode with uh, the city of Kansas City, talking about their their bike program and the plan coming up for the city of Kansas City. Now we're switching gears, uh, another transportation joke, a little bit, to um, the city of Olathe. And 41 Action News reporter Charlie Keegan, who's here to talk about 
uh, traffic in Olathe, specifically dealing with red lights. And this is a really interesting story you had on 41 Action News today uh, just a couple of days ago about a new app they're using uh, with a great name because it's I'm, I'm a pun. I'm a fan of puns whenever right. we can get them. Charlie, tell me about this app that Olathe is uh, trying to implement. Well, I'll hit you with the name right off the bat. It's called Enlighten. Enlighten. Okay. And it's uh, all about helping you kind of catch the green lights uh, and so that you can flow through traffic nice and smoothly and not the stop and go of red light, green light, red light, green light. And uh, so it's just kind of like a, uh, almost like a navigational tool to help you maintain a speed so that when you, you can hit all the green lights as they're timed out properly throughout the, the city. I had a chance to, to sit down with the city of Olathe's traffic operations manager, Dave Kumke, and he kind of uh, gave me a little bit of an explanation of like an example maybe of when someone might be using this app. We have a soundbite of that too. If you're in the, a flow of heavy traffic with trucks in front of you, you don't know if there's, a advantage, if, it, if there's an advantage to passing him or not. This will tell you it's got an ind- indicator similar to a digital speedometer, um, and it's called GLOSA, the Free Light Organ Optimization Speed Advisory. Um, oh, FLOSA, I think. FLOSA would be. No, uh, it's I misspelled free. Free is supposed to be green. Green oh, light green line. optimization. Okay. So green speed line advisory. optimization speed advisory. It'll tell you if you stay in this area of the green band, you'll make the next green signal. If you speed too quickly, you'll run back into uh, what we call the queue, uh, the back of the vehicles, and have to stop. So it helps drivers manage their speed so they can better get through the flow of the corridor. It's pretty cool. Green light optimization. What were the last two that he said there? Speed advisory. Speed advisory. So um, that, you know, no offense to him, but that's that sounds pretty complicated, Charlie. Uh, uh, a lot of apps, when you describe them to people, right. sound complicated until you use them in, in person. Really, how is a is – this is in place already. People can download this yeah, and, yeah, and get yeah. it. Okay. It's up and running, and it, the app is like – it's almost too simple. Okay. Uh, it, honestly, like you, you can't really do anything with it except for watch it and to to tell you if the light's green or red. It's, okay. It's really like hard to mess up. I pulled it up on my phone right now, but since we're not in Olathe, not going to pull and not Driving <laughs> anywhere, it's not going to do anything. Uh, but I can. I mean, there's a little like speedometer type of dial on the bottom of mm-hmm. the, of the of the app, and as you drive through Olathe that dial turns red or green, and then if your needle stays in the green section of the dial, then you're going to hit the next light at a green signal. If okay. your arrow stays in the red section of the dial, then if you continue at that speed, you're going to hit a, gr- a red light when you get to... How, how far ahead are we talking here? Like if I've got a red light coming up in, I don't know, you know 500 feet or 500 yards even, what, what are we talking about? Yeah, it, it, it knows the next signal that you will okay. be approaching. So however far away that next signal is, it's the one closest to you. Okay. Does it identify the streets as well, or is it just telling you, just giving you a light indicator as well as all it is? All it does is give you a light indicator, okay. right? So there's no GPS navigational function of it. It just knows that there's a light ahead and stay in the green. Are there certain streets it works on and doesn't work on in Olathe? So I was driving around Olathe, and it is, seems a little hit or miss. It's supposed to work throughout the entire city of Olathe, right. and it... And, uh, I felt like it would drop off in some areas and then pick up in other areas, and maybe that's just a function of, of an app and not being. But perfect. you were sure you were in Olathe the whole time because I mean some of those some of those street limit signs kind of right. will get you lost whenever they bump up against other right. cities. Then you're in Lenox all of a sudden or Oakland yeah, Park, and right. you don't know it. But it does say you're out of coverage area when you leave. Okay, so it's a different alert when you leave the. It will the tell city you when limits. you're no longer in the city right. limits. Okay, so the thing that we talked about when you did this story and that was um, an obvious question for a lot of people became. Uh, you're not supposed to be on your phone while you're driving. Right. Um, and if, if you're in your car by yourself, um, which a lot of people are, obviously, if yeah. they're headed to work in the mornings or that kind of thing, you're driving around running errands, um, this app seems to want to encourage someone to either be holding it or put it on their dash, but at the very least, paying attention to the phone while it's up and running. Yeah. Um, how does the city kind of justify what that what that looks like in practice? Right, that is the number one criticism for sure. And I received a lot of pushback when I tweeted about it on Friday when the story aired on yeah. our news, and everybody was like, on Twitter was just all about, "Oh, great, a distracted driving," or "I guess I'll never drive in Olathe. I'm liable to get hit by a, a distracted driver." Yeah. And so the app itself and the city of Olathe both kind of have like a disclaimer, you know, asking you not to hold the phone while you drive and stare at it while you drive, but that you should hand it over to a passenger if applicable or if you're by yourself, you know, dock it into a you know, some sort of holder on mm-hmm. your dashboard. Like, you know, you see everybody has those suction cups for their uh, <laughs> right. uh, GPS version. 
and and just kind of maybe watch it out of the side of your eye uh, as you drive down the road and and try and gauge whatever's comfortable for you as a driver or if it's if you feel like it's too distracting then don't use it you know yeah. there's the simple answer there and that leads you back to what you were talking about about the app itself being simplistic and not having a whole lot on there it's really just you should be able to and not to defend the app or right. the city or anything like that but in practice you should be able to place it on a dash look down, glance down as you're driving and see whether or not you're in a, the right color. That's it, all you're looking for. Exactly. Yep. And then uh, another function of the app, uh, not to add on, oh, it's so simple, <laughs> which is so perfect, but it also does. <laughs> but when you're at, when you do get stuck at a red light, it normally has a countdown of how long this light's going to remain green. Really? So as you okay. stop at a light, you can look and go, oh, well, 13 more seconds to sit here until this light turns green. So while you're stopped, you can uh, you now monitor that's, that. That's interesting. I didn't know about that part, Sam. So speaking of, of knowing when things are going to change, so one of the things I pay attention to, especially here in Kansas City, Missouri, is the uh, the countdown clock on a crosswalk. Yeah, and uh, on one of the on one of the streets I come in on uh, on Ward Parkway on the south side of the plaza, I know that the intersection at Ward Parkway and Warnell, um, I can see the countdown clock, and I know that that's basically not just a crosswalk clock, but it's the clock until I get to yellow. And so if, if I'm if I'm able to see what that like number as is, you're approaching it, you can see the number, right? And if it's you know counting down, I might speed up a little bit to know I can make the light. Yeah. So with the knowledge, it's like on the app, if you're borderline toggling right. between a green and a red. Presumably, a driver could change their behavior and say, "All right, I want to get back into the green zone." Right. Uh, is there any concern that people might, you know, kind of change their driving habits or um, speed through a yellow? That's a great question. Right. Yeah. Try to try to catch that green. Exactly. Yeah. That's definitely a concern, and it's just uh, something that the city is asking folks to just be a responsible driver when you're using the app as best you can and, and not uh, 